Uh, yeah. Uh, family, y'all. Just keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh. So the question becomes, how can a person like Bishop Vasquez, we're using that example, claim to be a validly consecrated bishop. Have you ever attended the consecration of a bishop? What happens at the consecration of a bishop? There's not just one person consecrating, but there are various co-consecrators. Think about this for a moment. Because if Bishop Joe Vasquez were consecrated by one bishop, but that bishop were later found not to be a validly consecrated bishop, what happens with Bishop Vasquez? He's no longer a validly consecrated bishop. You follow me? If Joe Vasquez is consecrated by another person whom he believes was a validly consecrated bishop, but later it comes to light that that person was not a validly consecrated bishop, what happens? Then he is no longer a validly consecrated bishop because you have to be consecrated by another validly consecrated bishop. So far so good? So, what if there were two people at the consecration who consecrated Bishop Joe Vasquez and it comes to light that neither was validly consecrated? What does that mean for Bishop Vasquez? He is not validly consecrated. So what happens at consecrations is that various bishops come together typically so that it's not simply relying on whether or not one person is validly consecrated but it's all of those other persons being validly consecrated. So if Bishop Vasquez wants to challenge the fact that Archbishop Amen was validly ordained, you certainly have the right to do that, but then you have to prove that all of those persons who were present at his consecration were not validly consecrated themselves, because if even one bishop at Archbishop Amen's consecration was validly consecrated, what does that mean? Archbishop Amen is validly consecrated. If there are all sorts of bishops participating in the ceremony, all it takes is one of those archbishops tracing, one of those bishops tracing his or her lineage back to the apostles for us to have apostolic succession for Archbishop Amen to say that he received apostolic succession. So here we have Archbishop Amen down here, a man we know and love, who's being consecrated by all these people, right? If the, the apostolic succession of any of these persons is questioned, so long as there's one person who can be traced back to the apostles as being validly consecrated, then Archbishop Amen enjoys apostolic succession. The same could be true of, said of any other bishop. Bishop Vasquez, why does he pretend to call himself a bishop? Because he believes that there is at least one person going between him, going all the way back, there's at least one line of apostolic succession going back to the apostles. Archbishop Johnson, we all know and love him. How could he say that he is a validly consecrated bishop? Because he has in his lineage, he believes that there is at least one, we know that there are several, but that there is at least one person, one line, tracing its way back to the apostles. And so long as you have one line of valid apostolic succession, you are validly consecrated a bishop. And so that's why we often have multiple consecrators at the consecrations of bishops. Why? To, simply to make it bulletproof. So that no one can come back later and say, Bishop Joe Vasquez, you make me laugh. You're not really a bishop. You're not validly consecrated. Wait a minute. All he has to do is produce his lineage and the lineage of all those other persons to be able to show that it goes back to the apostles. So the question then could be, is Archbishop Johnson validly consecrated in the American Catholic Church? Well, let's take a look at, the, at his lineage. We're going to take a look at his lineage here. So on these pages then, in these five pages, we, we sum up the entire lineage of Archbishop William Johnson. It only takes five pages. What do we do with these five pages? So we start with Archbishop William Johnson at the top. And what we're going to do is this is sort of like an outline form. So that, for instance, all of the numbers below him were the consecrators at his Episcopal consecration. So he was, he was consecrated by Archbishop Lawrence Harms on the first page. And then we go to number two, which is on page 
five, Bishop Michael Bernard Norton, and Bishop Carl Gregory Pervenus Smith. Okay, so there were three bishops at Archbishop Johnson's uh, consecration. So we'll take these away to make it to make it fair. Here, there were three persons when he was consecrated in 2009, October 3rd, 2009. Archbishop Johnson. There were three bishops present who were doing the consecrating. Now, are we ready? We're just going to explore, for instance, the first bishop. We said here, so here we have uh, Archbishop Johnson, then Bishop Johnson, and here we have Archbishop Harms. We're going to explore his heritage. So he's number one. So then in outline form, then, the A, B, C, etc. that are following that would be his consecrators. So for instance, he was consecrated by Bishop John Rinaldi, letter A. On page two is letter B, Bishop Donald Jeremiah Buttenbush. Letter C, Bishop William Timlin. Letter D on page three, Bishop Joseph Anderson Johnson. Bishop Jude Egby. And letter F on page five, Bishop Michael Scalsey. So we have there A, B, C, D, E, and F, six consecrators of Bishop Harms. One, two, three, four, five, six. So far so good? Okay. Now, it, it keeps going in. There, there, are, there are so many names on here that we can't go through them all. But you can see in the, in the dark font are the names of the different churches through which these lines go. So you can see, for instance, the Russian Orthodox Church. Wait a minute, we talked about the Orthodox Catholic Church before? We know that the Orthodox or right-believing Catholic Church has various manifestations. The Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Georgian Russian Orthodox Church, the Byzantine Orthodox Church, we could go on and on. The Russian Orthodox Church. So when we see, for instance, the Russian Orthodox Church, how interesting. Archbishop Harms has one line of secession back to the Apostles through the Russian Orthodox Church. We can see other, ones, other names we might recognize. For instance, we see in there the Old Roman Catholic Church or the Old Catholic Church. How interesting. We also see in there the Roman Catholic Church and churches that are in communion with the Roman Catholic Church. Let's take a good example of the Roman Catholic Church. For instance, on page 2, we have the Duarte Costa lines. So, a bit of history here. Who is Duarte Costa? Oh my God. That was a Roman Catholic bishop in Brazil. Bishop Carlos Duarte Costa was a validly consecrated Roman Catholic bishop consecrated on December the 8th, 1924 for the Roman Catholic Church. Who is he consecrated by? We can see the four consecrators there that were present as his, at his consecration. So suddenly, for instance, in this line of Archbishop Harms, we see how it was that there is a Roman Catholic bishop in Brazil. We can see his lineage too, because what happens is, with any of these bishops, with Bishop Joe Vasquez, for instance, love the man, what if he decided tomorrow that he was no longer able to sing the Mickey Mouse song? Whoa. Bishop Joe Vasquez leaves the Roman Catholic Church tomorrow. What happens then? He's suddenly outside of the purview of the Roman Catholic Church, probably either looking for, I mean, he, does he lose his, does he lose his bishopness? No, he's a validly consecrated bishop. And so if he leaves the church tomorrow and decides to consecrate Susie tomorrow at lunch, what happens? Susie is validly consecrated. So these lines, how interesting. So the, the Duarte Costa line is interesting, but let's just be honest, it's not the most interesting line in, in all of this. The most interesting line, if we were to look at it, is actually on page, page 5. So we refer to it often as the Malingo line. Or on page 5, at the top there's a letter H, Archbishop Emmanuel Malingo. We see how it was that he was consecrated on August 1st, 1969. Ooh, think of all that was happening back about that time, right? Pope Paul VI. For the Roman Catholic Church, who was he consecrated by? Oh my God, he was consecrated by Pope Paul VI. So if you believe that Pope Paul VI 
was a validly consecrated bishop, and of course you can argue that, but if you believe that Pope Paul VI of the Roman Catholic Church was a validly consecrated bishop, then, and he laid his hands on another person, Emmanuel Malingo, and that person, Emmanuel Malingo, Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church, is now validly consecrated, then what happens when Archbishop Malingo, who has in his lineage Pope Paul VI, and Pope Benedict XV, and Pope Pius X, whoa! The question becomes, are you going to argue that Pope Pius X, Pope, Pope Benedict XV, a Pope, Pope Pius XII, a Pope, Pope Paul VI, a Pope, are you going to argue that they don't enjoy apostolic secession? Because if those popes enjoyed apostolic secession, what's happening? This gift of the Spirit is being passed down through those popes, through Emmanuel Malingo, to a person like Archbishop Harms, to a person like Archbishop Johnson. Fascinating, and I'm sure for many, mind-blowing. But that's the rich and diverse history that we have as a church. How it is that we, that we have this apostolic succession. And if only one of these lines is valid, right? Maybe you want to argue about, oh, this Carlos Duarte Costa line, or this Malinga line, or this Russian Orthodox line. All it takes is one line. So, okay, if we argue those, and we'll exclude the line of all the popes, okay, let's say that that's not a valid line, right? All it takes is for one of these lines somewhere going back to the apostles to be valid for a bishop to be valid. Only takes one line. All the others can be invalid. It only takes one valid line for you to be a validly consecrated bishop. So how do we view the Pope in all this? We just mentioned one line with several popes in it. How do we view the Pope? In the American Catholic Church, who is the Pope? And what is his role in the church? We recognize that the, that the Pope, we use the word Pope, but who is the Pope really? I mean, going back to those divisions in the church, when there were five patriarchs in the church, the Pope was the patriarch of Rome. Or back before we used the word patriarch, the Pope was the bishop of Rome. And what happened when all the bishops came together in a council? Well, someone needed to lead the meeting. Someone needed to chair the meeting. Who's going, who is the chairman of the meeting? We refer to. We often look to the Bishop of Rome. Why? Because where did Peter die? Rome. Where did Paul die? Rome, according to the tradition of the church. And so, according to the tradition of the church, there is a certain center of the church there in Rome. In the same way that there was a center of the church in Jerusalem, and in Antioch, and in Alexandria, and Constantinople, one of the centers of the church was in Rome. And so when we got together as a council of bishops, we needed someone to chair the meeting. And in some of those councils, the person who was chairing that meeting was the person who was the first among equals. In Latin, we called it the primus inter pares. Primus is Latin for first, inter, among, pares, equals, right, in Spanish, los numeros pares are equal numbers, right? The primus inter pares is the first among equals. We acknowledge that the Pope is the first among what? Equals. Is the Pope somehow over other bishops? Wait a minute, the Pope is a bishop. The Pope is consecrated a bishop. When all the bishops get together, he is the first among equals. With the other bishops and with the other patriarchs of the church, which is why in the American Catholic Church and in other churches outside of Rome, we pray for the Pope, but we use different words. We pray for the patriarchs of the church. What a difference that is. When you, in Holy Family, when we pray for the patriarchs of the church, who are we praying for? Yes, we're praying for the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. But we're also praying for the, for the, the Patriarch of Constantinople, and the Patriarch of Alexandria, and the Patriarch of Antioch, and the Patriarch of Jerusalem, and all of the Patriarchs of the Church, because it's that common model of leadership that the early Church espoused, and that we continue to espouse today. It's not this hierarchy, this pyramid of one person being on top of the other, on top of the other, no. Of how it is that the bishops always saw themselves as deciding these things, as, as evident in the Second Vatican Council. All 2,000 Roman Catholic bishops of the world came together, were eyelash to eyelash together, determining matters of the church. We consider the Pope the patriarch of the West. How interesting of these five, then, that the one who is over here in Italy, 
The others were in, in Constantinople and Antioch and Jerusalem and Alexandria. There became this east-west split. So we acknowledge him as the patriarch of the West. The Western church, after the split, church split, he became the, the patriarch of the Western church from which we come. And let's be honest, who else is the pope? He is the first one of all these patriarchs to amass sufficient people and wealth to be able to use that as a certain club, if you will, right? What are the two sources of power and influence in this world? Organizing people and or organizing money. And as I'm fond of saying, it was the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, who had the best fundraising scheme in the history of the church. Think about it for a moment. In the American Catholic Church, will the American Catholic Church ever rival the Roman Catholic Church with its billion adherents and with all of its funds? No. Why not? Because how much of our money every Sunday goes to Archbishop Johnson? How much money are we going to send him from our collection last Sunday? Zero. In the American Catholic Church, there has never been this, this uh, pyramid scheme of money going upwards because what happens is then when money starts consolidating, it becomes a source of power and influence. And the question is rightly raised, is that what Jesus wanted? Is that what Jesus wanted? Did Jesus want all sort of gold altars, gilded altars in his churches throughout the world that cost so many millions of dollars when people in this world are dying? Yes. And so we love and we support all of our brothers and sisters of the Roman church, and especially the Pope. We pray for the Pope every Sunday at Holy Family Catholic Church and any American Catholic Church, but we do so praying for all of the patriarchs of the church.